Um, okay. Hi guys. Um, um hang on, Mary. Okay. Can you take your mask off, please? Oh, do you want me to? Please. please. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, hello everyone. My name's Mary Kahns. I'm here today with the Monona Grove School District's community or sustainability committee. Um I am here today, my name is Mary Kahns. I'm here with Peter Sobel, Teresa Rademacher, Krishna Elwell, and Lynn Lashesky. Um, a month from today, construction is going to begin on what will become the largest rooftop solar array in Wisconsin. And on, our, on a school, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what will be, <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm already off to a shaky start. It will be on a school, it will be on my school, which I'm super stoked about. Um, there are over a thousand K through 12 facilities in this state, and I get to brag that my school will have the largest rooftop solar array. Um, bragging rights aren't the only thing that I'm excited about, though. I get to brag that this project will be cash flow positive in its first year of completion. That money, I'm hoping, could be used for new uniforms for our girls' sports teams, for a DJ at prom, or for new and improved arts facilities. However, those are things that I'm excited about, and those of you in this room probably aren't so much. You've all graduated high school, but that's what's important to students like me. Something else that's important to students like me is that this solar array will save 31 tons of carbon dioxide, which is going to move our district towards a more sustainable future. By conservative estimates, this project will save our district more than one and a half million dollars over its lifespan. I'm very stoked about that. <laughs> um, the array is almost entirely financed through standard conventional means, which every district already uses. It's supported by grants that we were able to secure. There are 435 school districts in the state of Wisconsin. Everyone in this room, aside from myself, has already graduated high school, but that doesn't mean your lives aren't connected to a district. We all know a student. You may be one yourself or your, your child may be. Most of your taxpayer dollars are spent to, new, to improve Wisconsin school districts. We're all impacted by the work that goes on within Wisconsin schools. The financial and environmental benefits of our solar project are obvious, and it's easy to see how your school district could benefit from the lessons we've learned. We're here today to help you do so. Thank you, Mary. I'm, I'm Peter Sobel. I've I'm on the, a board member on the Monroe Grove School District. I've been on the board for uh, 15 years. Um, and um, uh, this isn't, we, we want to talk, what we want to do today is give people tools to get this, to get clean energy to happen. And as Mary pointed out, there's a great benefit. There's great benefits uh, to doing this. Um, and, um, what we want to say, what I want to start first talking about is that there are 2,000 school buildings in Wisconsin, all with flat roofs, all whose primary energy use is in the middle of the day. They're all the centers of their community. They all enjoy pretty robust public support. They are all trying to save a dime right now. And they're a natural place for the expansion, for the penetration, the acceptance of building acceptance of clean energy in Wisconsin, right? And so that's what we're starting to do in our school district. That's what we would like to see in the rest of Wisconsin. And um, we wanna tell you a story about how we got, how we got here. And um, with me today are members of our, some members of our sustainability committee, some students and some citizen members who will each have their own perspective and so you're gonna to get to hear my perspective, you're gonna to get to hear perspectives of citizens and students, how we got there. And hopefully these are useful tools um, for the process that you can use moving forward. Um, now I've been on a school board for 15 years and I have to say it's been an interesting experience in education for me. And I have to say that public schools face unique challenges when it comes to things like sustainable energy. You know, where funding is restricted, it's difficult, you know, it's difficult to raise money and spend money. There's a lot of law, state law we have to do it. There's limits to our revenue limits and there's certain, you, you know, you need to raise money to capital expense, you need a referenda often. Um, so there's, there's limitations. And the other thing is that they're experts in schools. So anything outside of the school uh, of education is gonna be a hard, can be a hard sell. They don't have the experience, they don't know how it's done, and they're not gonna to wanna to 
take it on. And the other thing is, these are public institutions. Successes you never hear about, failures can be front page news. So administrators, school boards, they're naturally conservative, they're naturally risk averse, right? So if we wanna make progress, we have to find ways to grease the skids of that path. Uh, grease the skids, get dead schools down the, that path. It's a natural place for them, to space for them to be, but they're not. And so how do we get them there? Um, what we're, the place we're at right now is we're in the process, as Mary mentioned, of building a um, 674 kilowatt array on our high school. For the district, we've got several goals that we're, we're meeting. Um, and part of this is uh, there's a positive financial return, um, but we're also making clean energy integral to school operations. This isn't a showcase project. This is gonna be how the district powers itself, right? From here on out. By, it's going to be half the electric bills on this, uh, in, in the, on this facility, and hopefully we can move it out to the rest of the district. Um, but this makes clean energy integral to our operations. But we wanted to go beyond that. Um, and what we want to do is provide a, a, a model that other school districts can use, okay? And it, to, to, to raise awareness and with the goal eventually of helping mainstream clean energy in Wisconsin, right? What do I mean by making a reproducible model for schools? The first slot, the argument for this ends, can end after that first sentence. I'm saving a million and a half dollars to the school district. There isn't anybody in Wisconsin who can disagree with that, who can, who's gonna question that statement. You know, one's gonna say, well, we shouldn't do that. Said, the argument to do this, why should we do this? I can stop right there. Obviously, there's lots of other benefits and reasons to do this, but the argument doesn't have to continue beyond there to make this happen. Um, so it's, it's positive financially. Um, this business as usual funding tools, I think is really important. We're not doing anything special to raise money. I can go to our business manager, who's a key factor here and say, and he knows how to bond fund up to the referendum limit, which is what this project needed um, to get that done, to get this done. We also got a uh, EIGP grant for 25% of this. That's not essential for this project. It does improve the margins, but with the interest rates where they are, we could, this could be accomplished actually without this grant funding. It would be close to break even in the first until the bonds are paid off instead of cash flow positive. Um, that's the other thing people in schools know how to do. We know how to go to grant sources and get those grants. But the fact that the bulk of this is bond funding, it's just what we do every day is what makes this a model that other school districts can use. Um, retrofit to existing facility, we save a lot of money with new facilities compared to old facilities when it comes to energy use. However, there's 2000 buildings, most uh, in Wisconsin between now and 2050, most of them are still gonna be in use. We're gonna have to retrofit, we can't do new projects if we wanna make substantial progress on clean energy goals. We're gonna have to do retrofits. And then the last thing we want to do is publicize this, make our data, make our experience available to everybody so that people can learn from this and uh, move forward quickly and don't have to go through the same process, the same time, take the same time that we did. Um, so how did we get here? First thing we did was, work, was develop capacity in the district to do this. Uh, years ago, we picked up some low hanging, what we'll call low hanging fruit with efficiency projects funded with the state revenue exemption. That's complicated. You don't have to know about it. You don't know a lot about it other than there was an opportunity for a little bit of money and to do it at low risk. We developed a relationship with an industry partner. partner. We did this through an RFP process um, and um, McKinstry had the most attractive um, offer, most attractive uh, proposal, and we developed a working relationship. Um, the initial projects led to more ambitious projects. In the end, we, over several years, we end up at least just through efficiency projects, which sort of started with caulking, you know, easy stuff. We eventually believe we're saving about $250,000 a year in operation savings. At the end of that, you know, these steps here, what this has done is that the stakeholders in the district, they've developed a literacy in saving money through, you know, sustainable projects. And they've got relationships, they've got relationships with vendors, they've got trust in this process. 
Uh, the business manager who has to be dragged kicking and screaming to spending the money the first time around, you know, is now familiar with the process. And, um, uh, and we have the capacity and is then, you know, and everybody has the familiarity with the capacity um, to work on this. And that is because we started with some initial low hanging fruit and then built from there. And now I'm gonna uh, hand this over to Teresa Rademacher, who's a citizen member of our committee. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's say you're here today and you're thinking to yourself, I'm not really sure I know what 674 kilowatts is. It looks like a lot to me, but <laughs> I'm just a mom or a dad or a student in my school district. I wanna save some money, um, but I'm not an expert, right, on this stuff. I'm just someone with a little bit of drive and interest to get stuff done. I just want to tell you that you are more powerful than you think, and you're closer than you think to really making some changes in your school district. Um, this quote that I started off the slide with is my favorite ever, and these guys have heard me say it way too many times, but I really want you to think about that. The soft stuff makes the hard stuff happen. Building relationships is the first place that you're gonna wanna start. Maybe you, um, meet someone at a barbecue. Maybe you talk to someone at a picnic and you float these ideas past them. What do you think? Could we do this at our, at our district? I think we can. Then you're gonna to wanna to find your allies, right? Your partners, get to know your school board members. This is critical. The number one job that a school board has is to make policy and to, um, there's a couple other things that they're, you know, they do by law and they hire a superintendent and such, but that's their job, right? So this is where you come in to influence your school board members. Don't just show up at a meeting and make a demand, like work from the bottom up. This is where your power comes from. Um, get to know your school's history. How ready is your district? Have you already done some renewable energy efficiency? Not, not, a, not renewables, but efficiency projects, right? It's where you're gonna start first. Have you even done that? That's your low hanging fruit that Peter just talked about. Once you get people comfortable with that, then you can introduce a bigger project. Once you get a few wins on that smaller scale, you move on to the bigger stuff. And then understand the business case. I cannot stress this enough. You have to make a business case for this. And finally, on this slide, know your school leadership. Everybody knows who a superintendent is, but to amplify what Peter started to talk about, do you know who your district's business manager is? This is the critical stakeholder that you must influence. Without their blessing, this doesn't happen. In every school district, this is the person you need to get to know and understand and appreciate the challenges that they're up against. So what we did doesn't necessarily have to be what you do, but this is what we did. That's what we're here to talk about today. So like I was saying, we just started casually with conversations, approaching school board members, floating ideas. We built some allies on the board. I first started talking with someone who I later learned was um, an educator, came to the school board as an educator. And you know there was a little traction, but kind of seemed lukewarm. Then I uh, cornered Peter at a, at a community festival. Peter doesn't come from an education background, comes from a different a business background. That's your ally, right? That's who you wanna work with. Um, and then the idea was, Peter, what do you think? Um, you guys are so busy right now. Good Lord, you've got so many challenges, so much on your plate. There's a lot of people in our community that are experts at this. What if we offload? What if we get them to sort of do the heavy lifting, look at some statistics, analyze some data, and then make recommendations to the board because we can't expect you to know this stuff. He liked it. He was our internal ally, floated the idea to the board. And then when it came to a decision to vote, parents and students came out and we spoke at school board meetings and the idea to have a committee passed, right? So build from the ground up, you're more powerful than you think. So once we got the approval to have a committee, who do we want on that committee? Well, the first thinking is you're gonna want your industry experts with technical you know, knowledge. That's true, you need that. And there were many forks in the road where a few very key experts on our committee really steered us in the right direction and made us think of things we wouldn't have ever thought of because they've done this before. 
So absolutely, you want that. You want people to be able to analyze energy data from all your facilities and pick the project that you should tackle first. You want people who are sort of like your community organizers, your leaders, your motivators. They're the ones that are gonna build support on the ground and get your community behind this. And probably people with grant writing experience. That's, that was so helpful for us. You know, I had never written a grant before. That was a massive help to have someone on our board who, or committee who knew how to do that. Maybe people who understand local government, that's sort of a key group of influences in your community. Ideally, those are the folks that are gonna take your lessons learned and bring them back to your municipality, right? Put solar on another building based on what you've learned from your school. Teachers, boots on the ground, students in the building, employees that are in the building, give you the feel for the energy in the building. They know who's the advisor of the sustainability club, who's the environmental science teacher at school. Boots on the ground, you need that. And then somebody else, I would say just people who can, um, I put this up there, GSD, you know what I mean? People who can get it done, project managers, people who are just driven, you can make a plan, stick to the plan, stay on topic, get your meetings going. Um, people who can be photographers and document the process, multimedia, social media people, and then people who just like each other and can work together. This is not a committee for us anyway, not a committee of just advisors. This is a committee of worker bees. So um, think about that too. And I'm gonna hand it off to one of our technical experts, Lynn Lisowski. So I have to say when I joined the committee and came to the first five meetings, I thought, oh my God, <laughs> I can't eat enough of these snack candy bars because we're, we're, we're churning, we're churning, we're churning. And the learning process was slow for me because of course I've worked for a number of companies and led sustainability. And I thought, well, we have to get to that point where we understand that it's resource efficiency and efficiency in our operation that we're looking at. We're not doing sustainability. And so that was, that was a long road for our committee. But once you get that mindset, you understand that you're trying to make a change that's substantial and not just put a little thing out there and, and uh, change a few trays in the cafeteria. We're trying to make a substantial change that not only is a change for the school, but a change for the community. And especially what I liked about this project was that we were dealing with schools. So who can change the community better than teaching the young people what sustainability and what resource conservation is all about. And so by introducing them to solar, we were able to introduce them to, oh, this is, this is the normal. This is the normal that I could do on my home when I own a home. And that's what we were trying to do. But it was a long road getting there. And I, I, I can't say that enough, really. <laughs> One of the things that um, we did was that we did develop a list of projects and we went through our projects. We said, well, we could do the trays or we could um, change some lighting or maybe we could um, have carpooling. And I thought, oh God, how are we ever gonna get kids to carpool? That's just not their thing right now. They have sports, they have all these things. We gotta find something we can actually do. And so what really um, changed it for us is when we saw this grant. It wasn't that the grant was going to provide, you know, an endless pool of money for it, but it was enough that we could say, well, we have the ability to do something really big. And, and so we kicked around what size solar, and then I think it was Peter and Ken Walls from the uh, uh, Madison College that said, well, let's make it the biggest. And I thought, oh, that's incredible. <laughs> we moved from trays to the biggest solar array on a school. I'm I was really impressed and, and how quickly we moved because there was very little time to get this grant together and everybody got their sections and, and put them together. And um, I think that that was uh, the game changer. That was the important thing for us was that we just didn't think about the boundary of what might 
well, that would be kind of hard. It was like, no, well, let's just try it. If we don't make it, that's okay. Uh, and we got the grant and um, we were able to fund it. And I think that was, uh, it made us feel like, wow, we've got to start now. And we could really put this on a lot of, of other, other schools. I mean, you ha we had to start with one that really um, had a lot of return, right? Because you want people to buy into this and you want them to see the benefits, not only financially, but to the environment. So as you build your momentum and you have to start with something that really is big and really makes an impact so that um, the next time you try and do something completely crazy, they say, oh, well, that worked and, and you had a good idea there. Well, maybe we could do that too. And so that's what we were hoping for. And that's what we're hoping the kids see when they come to their school that they're really proud of what uh, they've done and what the school has done for the environment. Thank you, that, that frustration that Lynn talks about, you know, I have experienced that over and over again in, with schools in many areas. Um, it's a big organization that's uh, governed by um, a lot of history, a lot of convention, a lot of state law, a lot of pressures and getting things done is so often a long, hard education experience that you have to, you know, it, you, there's just, there's not it's not like there's a wheel, there's a superintendent in the wheelhouse and he have the ship and he turns the wheel and the ship goes. No, there's a chain of people on there. In order to get the ship to turn, you know, you have to get everybody holding hands together in that long chain between the ship and the rudder, between the wheel and the rudder. And so it can be a long process, educate process of building experience and um, building education and bringing everybody along, bringing everybody together. For better or worse, it's like that. And this is the way you have to deal with your local school districts if we want to make, if you want to make a difference. Um, as Lynn mentioned, this grant solicitation provided focus. I want to point out that um, there was a 90-day submission window. We have a one and a quarter million dollar project. We've got approval for this from administration, from the finance, from the school board in less than 90 days with hardly any questions. Back in 2007, when we wanted to put caulk in the schools, it took on some of the buildings, it took 18 months to get any motion at all, okay? And the board business manager had to be dragged this first time, kicking and screaming to that. And she had a lot of questions and a lot of concerns and a lot of, you know, about the whole process. And we're at a place now where, this is all an easy sell for us. And that's where you have to get if you're gonna get your school district to move. You're gonna, you can't, you're gonna to have to get them to the place where they can do this, this kind of thing. And how do you do that? Draw on the community expertise. Ken Walls, who's the Director of Sustainability at MATC, lives in our district. Lynn Lozuski, who's retired from PepsiCo where she was North American, uh, coordinator for the director for the, their sustainability efforts. She lives in our district. Teresa, who has all kinds of energy for this, lives in our district. You know, if she doesn't know this, but if we if the sun isn't enough to power our districts, we're going to hook her to a treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> um, start with low risk. Build relationships. You know, we have an ongoing relationship now with McKinstry um, that they're there, they're ready for us when we need information. They, we have their expertise on hand and everybody trusts them. And I understand that it's not the cheapest way to get something done. However, school districts, which need expertise from outside, which need resources to draw on, need relationships to do things. It's a way that enables it, us to get it done is to have this relationship that we can work, build from. Um, you need to understand the constraints of schools. You need to understand the constraints of schools as particularly what your local, the local constraints are, what the people, the local superintendent or the local business manager, what ha they have to deal with. You have to understand that so you can move forward. And then this last one, be ready. 
the opportunities will come up for us like the EIGP grant. Another thing for a school district that's important is that interest rates might drop. And suddenly you have financial opportunities that you didn't have, right? And what made part of this process is that we had been spinning our wheels about what to do. We talked about styrofoam cafeteria trays. We talked about carpooling, but we'd also talked about, well, what would solar on our schools look like? And when this opportunity came along, it's like, pick this one, this matches, this is a good project and we can do this. We're ready to do that. So be ready for the opportunity because that's the way schools work. They're year to year, they're, they have annual budgets. Um, they, they're, they're going to need often to wait for an opportunity to, to, to make something happen. Um, but the point being is you can make things happen. You can make big things happen. And I think that's important in Wisconsin for promoting clean energy. I think schools are a natural place to make it happen and a natural place for, um, to increase the penetration of clean energy in the state. And what's that? Time to go. So time, I, and that, now I'd like to open up for questions. No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Actually, I have to give it to cleanup. Our cleanup batter is Krishna Oh well, another student in our district. Good morning, everyone. Don't worry, I'm not the janitor. When he says clean up, just some finishing comments here. Every day, I ask myself whether or not I have a future, whether or not I am truly making a difference. This project embodies a message of hope to me that despite the fact we are embattled, our battle can be won. Every day I am told, I see how my future is being ripped from my hands. The older generations have forsaken us and soon all the older heroes will leave us to burn. Today, you and I, we have the possibility to make a difference. We have the possibility to make a future for ourselves. This project is a testament that we can make a change. And it gives me hope that if change can happen in my home, then it can happen in yours. For change will no longer await our choice. The future of your children is at life-threatening danger. The time to act is now. We need you to make this change happen. As a voice of youth today, I urge you to make this change happen in your schools, your cities, all across the state. Aside from its revolutionary practicality, it is a sign of hope that we can make a difference. Everyone has to start somewhere and start small, but neither is an excuse not to start. So get off your duff. Our time to act is now, now, now. <laughs> You know, there's, that's why I want to bring the student perspective here. Students feel about this. They see this very passionately and it's important. And not, and not only do we, you know, are we improving the financial situation of our school district? We're making a statement that we believe is important to the kids that are in our school. A lot of them are stressed about what they see going on in the world today we can make a change. So now I can take some questions. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize, Krishna. It's fine. <laughs> yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I thought that was an excellent series of presentations. I, I wanted to point out that there are a number of ways to go after your school district to get more renewable energy. <clears throat> I and a number of other people Madison Metropolitan School District. And we took a slightly different tack that may be of interest to some of you. Uh, in fact, we didn't take it. At the students at a group of students at West High started a process of, of trying to raise awareness like you folks have done. <laughs> um, their goal was to get funding for solar panels on the roof of West High. So that was really, this was back in the 2018, 2017. Yeah. And 
from that arose a broader interest in getting the whole district to move on renewable. And what we did, which was somewhat different from this strategy, is to we prepared a resolution for the board mm -hmm. and um, you know talked it up among students, faculty, parents, everybody, and took it to a board meeting. And they passed the resolution unanimously and without writing the uh, they, the district set a 2040 goal for being net zero uh, with, with the electric energy. And so that was kind of a, a jump, you know, from the, the ground to the top. And from that I led a number of actions in the district, uh, including the inclusion of um, a component in a referendum. Uh, for school funding that um, had, I don't know, a couple million dollars for sustainability, including solar panels. So I just wanted to give the idea that there's, as you said before, each district is different. Develop a strategy that fits your district. Learn from the examples that you get from others, but ultimately find one that works for your district. We are, yeah, we are very aware of that, uh, that initiative. Um, and we've been talking with Mary and Christian to do the same and just use that template. And, and once this project is um, off, or is on, then to have um, uh, another approach at the school board for, like I said, developing policies is the job of the school board, right? So, and I think the website is 100% Renew Madison, if I'm not mistaken, that people can go there and, and see the referendum and the, the survey and, and the petition that was put out to all the Madison School District. It was brilliant. Yeah, nice. And right now, Mary and Christian are very familiar with the Middleton Cross Plains School District and their model. So first it was Madison, then Middleton, and now we'll be following Middleton to do the same. There are additional questions online. Yeah, please. Yeah, there's a, there are several questions that have come online. Um, my name is uh, Samara Hamke, and I'm uh, on the review board and helping monitor the, the chat from those who are joining us virtually. Um, first of all, I want to mention that Ken Walls, who couldn't be here today, <laughs> um, is sharing on here to take a look at uh, what, what was already mentioned, but there's the solar toolkit that's provided uh, on the CREATE website. So you can see me afterwards for that. If you're online, you can see that um, already. Um, also, there's a couple of other questions that came up about funding. Both well, Ken pointed out that the MREA has uh, solar on school grant that is available. And uh, somebody named Zach Brown, who's online, is asking, other than solar on school, focus on energy um, uh, rebates that uh, incentives that we might have, the EIDP grant, are there other funding sources that are available to schools that you're aware of? Peter, can I just jump in and say that I don't want there to be, the grants and the, those are very important, but you may also find out that just business as usual financing gets the job done. And if you sit there and you think, I can't do this unless I get a grant, that's not true. And so I just don't want that to be overemphasized in terms of what's necessary. The numbers speak for themselves. The interest rates just don't worry about, I mean, I don't know. We're over time, aren't we? So the question was uh, related to how do we find funding sources and grants? And um, I think that's it. I, and I think my, I would like to say that grants and so on can help this process, but if we want to get 2,000 buildings, if we want to reduce our, you know, a school electrical, you know, greenhouse gas footprint by 50%, they're only going to go so far. However, we've got a project, we're just took out bonds. We just borrowed the money to do it and it pays for itself. It pays the interest. In the very the first year. In the Starting from the very first year will be cash flow positive. You don't need to do anything special to make this happen. That's the message. Right now, people think of these solar projects as special it's in terms of your utility bills, as this is a new special thing. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't have to be. It should be a normal part of our operations. It should be a no brainer. Every time a roof is changed, every time you, re, re, you, know, you replace a roof on a school building, it should be a no brainer to put solar panels on top of it and make money from that day without any special funding or financing necessary. The people on your committee, um, uh, when you build the trust with your administrators, we were given access to energy data that I 
they just let us look at it <laughs> because we had experts on our committee, trusted people on our committee that, that, you know, when you've got, you know, half a dozen buildings in your district or whatever the number might be, you can clearly just analyze those numbers and you can see how the financial argument is there for you. Um, Yes, yes. You can go to our website, which is on the very first slide and down here at the bottom. Yes, there, there's a... The slides, our grant proposal itself, the statistics of our project, everything is there. They'll be up there in a few There will be there. In a yeah. few days. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, are we using energy data as teaching tools? That is the intent. We don't have the energy data or the hardware yet. The project start, starts next month, this construction, but that's the, certainly the intent. And that's why you need boots on the ground. You need teachers. You need to build relationships. You need to know who your environmental science teachers are. You get them on your committee. And when I say committee, Peter defines that word differently because in his mind as a school board member committee means you're beholden to public and publicly announcing your agendas in advance of the meeting and taking minutes and everything's recorded just call it a work group call it whatever you want but get a group of people together that can get this done. And I might offer that Wisconsin K-12 energy education program this is what we do. Yeah. So the point Samara was making is that Wisconsin K through Say they again somewhere. Uh, keep K E E P, yeah. and they provide this information for you to follow. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I think I think we're over time. But if like there's one more, are we good? One more question from Kathy. Kathy. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that, that the Yeah, so um, Krishna and I are both Monona Grove School uh, representatives of a, a group called the Dane County Youth Climate or Environment Committee. Um, we meet once a month. We discuss like how we can help improve the sustainability policies and efforts within different districts in Dane County. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty. I think it's awesome. I, it's a great thing to be a part of. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I'll add on to that. Uh, I'm a vice president and I'm the president and two other vice presidents of Dane County Youth Environmental Committee are uh, with us today in this room. And I believe someone was mentioning earlier about how uh, solar was put on the Madison School District. And I actually met the person who was the student who was responsible for leading that effort, Charles Hua. He gave us a presentation. And so I just want to take this opportunity to say that if you are a parent, student, taxpayer, no matter what, you can make a difference. You all have a voice and that's all you need. You don't need to be rich or powerful to make your concerns heard. So with that, if anyone else has any questions, I'll pass it to them. Thank you. Was there another one online or? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Any questions? So how did you guys identify the new members would be useful to your initiative? Yeah. You, you just <laughs> every community has people who are just out there and you just got to find them and oh, and be bold there was an application process i applied well yeah and and uh, was accepted and uh that so there was a lot of applicants and so that i don't know who looked through them to decide we, who would be on there but there was quite we, a few applicants you know our district every district will work a little bit different for us we tend to like form committees to get things done. And when we do it, people look for that, people know that. And so we've started a committee, we published that we wanted to solicit members. People talk, and when you do that, people talk to people and say, oh, you might be good, you might please apply. Some people just, we don't know about, look at that, see that and apply. Um, we got a list of about 20 people mm -hmm. who applied for the mm -hmm. committee. Um, and we ended up with a committee of about 10 um, people for that. You, Reach out, publicize. Uh, I would also say that Dane County is different from the rest of the state. 
Mm-hmm. And but not that different. But not that different. Not in this way. You can do it. Well, you, you can do that. Some of the stuff is you're going to have to modify. It. But and this is why, for example, having a financially, um, our model is, well, this thing pays for itself. That's more important in the rest of the state than it is in, in Dane County, because I don't have to worry about justifying it to, in Dane County in terms of environmental benefits. But in the rest of the state, I do. We would. All right. for, for people who are listening from other parts of the state that are inspired by this, can they reach out to you for mentorship? Yes. To do this? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the question was, if uh, there are people in the rest of the state that are looking for some mentorship, can they reach out to us? And the question is absolutely yes. It is what we want you to do. It, it's it's one of the things we wrote in the grant application is that we are going to yeah. make our, make this available for other people to learn from, and that was one of. The, and so yes, we're obligated. We feel obligated to do that. We couldn't be more excited about this project, as you can tell. (laughs) Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you.